In this talk, we're going to ask, what is heritable human genome editing and when will it happen? And we'll start off with some definitions in the next 15 minutes or so, and then I'll try and explain what genome editing is. And then I'll introduce you to some characters throughout this talk, including the carpenter, and then we'll finish with a summary. So to those definitions, well, by edit, we simply mean the standard dictionary definition of edit, where we're going to make a precise, controlled change. And it can be a very large change, or it can be a very small change. And what we're changing is the genome. And the genome is really like an instruction manual that tells us what we are in a genetic terms. And every one or most of the trillions of cells in the bodies of each of us contains two instruction manuals, one that we've inherited from our mother and the other that we've inherited from our father. And these instruction manuals, each one is huge. It contains billions of characters, in fact, 3.2 billion characters. So if you imagine that each one of these characters is a ping pong ball, to give you an idea of how many characters there are in each of your cells, if each one is a, a ping pong ball, there will be enough in one cell to fill Wembley Stadium. Not once, or twice, or three times, or four times, or five times, but there will be enough ping pong balls to fill six Wembley Stadiums. So as you can see, I'm talking a lot of balls. And if you wanted to target, just to make a change to just one of those balls among six billion, that's a big ask. And the history of us being able to do that before 1989 looks like this. Nothing. We couldn't do it at all. And it wasn't until the work of these three geniuses came together about 10 years ago, they were awarded the Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine in 2007, that we could do this for the first time in the context of whole animals. We did it mostly for mice. And this has been a fantastically important method. It's really enabled biomedical research. But although what we can now call the classical method has been extremely important, it's clunky. It's slow, it's limited to one target, it's extremely expensive, it's labor-intensive, there's restricted expertise, not that many people can do it, and it has a very variable efficiency. And so the search continued for better, more improved methods. And that search was rewarded in 2005 and 2010 by methods that you may have heard of, zinc finger nucleases, ZFNs, and talons. And these were better, but still no cigar. And the search continued. And then, and then, in 2012 and 2013, it was rewarded with CRISPR-Cas9, with these three publications, all in science at about that time, that reported what CRISPR-Cas9 does. And what it does is incredibly quick. It's fast. It takes weeks, not years. It, you can target many targets at one time, so you can make multiple edits. It's economically, it costs hundreds of euros, not tens of thousands. It's streamlined, it's already widely practiced, and it is highly efficient. You shoot, you score. So although CRISPR-Cas9 doesn't do anything we couldn't do before, it just does it so much better that it's a game changer. So how does it work? Well, it works in two ways. The CRISPR-Cas9, first of all, does its part, which is to make a break in the genome. And then the cell repairs that break. And I'm going to talk about each of these one by one, starting with the CRISPR-Cas9 part. So this is the CRISPR-Cas9 that's going to do the genome editing. And in fact, it works like a pair of tiny molecular scissors and a molecular sat-nav. And the sat-nav that you get to program exactly whereabouts in the genome you want it to cut tells the scissors which you've programmed where to go and make the cut in the genome. And this is what it looks like. I mean, it, it's, it's an amazing system, really. It's a very simplistic and simplified diagram. But in the middle here, we have a representation of the genome, the genomic DNA. And this is a small part of these 6 billion characters per cell. And the sat-nav, the molecular sat-nav, actually looks really boring, really prosaic. And it's this bit here. It's about 110 characters long. It's called an RNA molecule or a guide RNA molecule. And although it looks boring, it's amazing. Because what it can do is interact with two things. One part of it can interact with the pink blobby thing here, which are actually the molecular scissors. They do the cutting. And the other part, 20 characters worth, can zip up with 20 characters, is specifically a 20-character stretch within that 6.4 billion nucleotides of genome sequence. And that 20 characters is enough to endow exquisite specificity to the whole system. So then, once that's happened, I've changed metaphors now. So now we're moving from an instruction manual to imagine the genome is like a piece of string. 
And we've cut the piece of string exactly where we want with our CRISPR Cas9. And now the cell has to repair that cut because these double-stranded breaks, as they're called, are bad news for cells. They sometimes occur naturally, and if they're not rapidly repaired, the cell can die. And indeed, it can be even worse. The entire organism can die. This is one way that cancer is initiated. So the cell quickly has to repair this. And the way it does this, so we've made our, we've made our break here with the CRISPR-Cas9 in a specified place that now targets the cellular repair machinery. All of this happens inside a cell. Each of your cells has this machinery. And what it does is it kind of acts like it uses the good instruction manual, naturally, to repair the bad instruction manual to which the damage has occurred. But what we've done is we've targeted the particular damage, the cut in the instruction manual, the cut in the genome, and now we can flood the whole system, the cell, with the information to repair just that part. And we can get to write the page or the sentences, we can insert bits or we can remove them. And it looks a little bit like, if we home in on this, it looks to me a little bit like a bridge. So we've got our extra piece of genome here, just a relatively small piece, and it looks like a bridge where the left foot of the bridge perfectly matches the left-hand side of the break made by CRISPR-Cas9, and the right side foot of the bridge matches perfectly the right side of the break. But what's in the middle, the span of the bridge, you get to decide what to put in. So you can make a very short span. In fact, it can correspond to a deletion of the DNA or a very long insertion. You can put thousands of characters in if you want to. So all of this really reminds me now of the carpenter. It's as if we've given the carpenter, a molecular carpenter, some amazing new tools. And of course, like all carpenters, he or she has a vision for what they want to make with these tools. And using their experience and expertise, they apply the tools to realize the vision using the process. So the vision that they have in the context of CRISPR-Cas9 is likely to be clinical. So most people are thinking that we can use this in the treatment or prevention of heritable or disease that's genetic with a genetic component. And to illustrate what that might be, I'd like to introduce you to Trubshaw. Trubshaw was born on the 22nd of April, 2013. By the, ages, by the time he's aged 17, he'll become a multi-billionaire, and at 28, he'll be the founder of Trubshaw Lunar Mining Inc. But when he's 34, he'll be diagnosed with a heritable terminal neurodegenerative disease. What hope might there be for Trubshaw and people like Trubshaw in 2047? Well, we might combine several different technologies, including genome editing, like this. Trubshaw might go to his hospital or clinic and give a simple cheek cell swab to the practitioner, to the clinician, to the doctor, and they will take them away and they will use something called induced pluripotency, which we can now do in humans as well as it was discovered in mice in initially. And what that hap does is to turn cells and make them like embryo cells. They're not embryos, but they're like embryo cells. And we can cause these cells to proliferate. We can grow them in the dish. And that gives us an opportunity to do editing. So we can go in now, we can add all of, our, uh, of the CRISPR-Cas9 components, and we can change the affected gene that predisposes to Trubshaw's condition. And now we can take those cells, because they're embryo-like cells, we can ask them to become neurons. So we can ask them, this is called directed differentiation, to become like neurons. And because it's all really derived from Trubshaw in a way, we can now transplant them back into Trubshaw so that Trubshaw is cured. Hurrah! So off he goes. And of course, he's very rich. He's a multi-billionaire, and he's got all this stuff, so, he, so, so the girls love him. So he finds the love of his life. He meets Mrs. T, and they decide that they want, to have, they want to start a family. They want to have children. The thing about having children, of course, is that Trubshaw's gene that predisposed to his neurodegeneration might be inherited by Trubshaw Jr., because we've only fixed Trubshaw's neurons. So what hope might there be for Trubshaw Jr. in the future? And this is where we come to heritable human genome editing by CRISPR-Cas9. So in heritable genome editing, what we're talking about is a change, an edit that we make, that can be transmitted to future generations. 
And there are two hypothetical strategies in humans that we might do this. So we're putting the pieces together in mice and model systems, but so far, everything I'm going to say from now on is really hypothetical. We think that it's in reach and it's foreseeable, but it's actually hypothetical in humans. But what we think we'll be able to do is we'll be able to either edit in the embryo or edit in gametes, the sperm and the egg. And I'm going to talk about these one by one, starting with the embryo. So embryos of the type that we're talking about are one-cell embryos. We all owe our origins to the one-cell embryo stage at some point. Okay? This is actually a mouse one-cell embryo, but human em one-cell embryos look very similar. And you can see here the maternal, the mother-derived, and the father's instruction manuals before they come together. And we can inject into this one-cell using a very gentle in injection protocol the CRISPR-Cas9 components that then can fix the gene so that now the embryo can develop and we can use standard assisted reproductive technologies which are current today in many fertility clinics to transfer the embryo into Mrs. T. She can carry the pregnancy and so when Trubshaw Jr. is born, all of his cells now contain that edit so he will not be predisposed to the neurodegenerative disease that his father had in the same way. And there are, in fact, many single-gene conditions that this kind of approach would, would apply to. And although they are... Uh, so there are probably about 6,000, probably more than 6,000 that are known, and although each one of these is individually quite rare, together they really add up to something. And in the UK, where I'm from, there are probably a million people who are affected in this way. So it's really very important. But actually, most disease has a genetic component from multiple different genes. And this includes all of, or many of the, all of our old favorites, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, cancer, irritable bowel disease, multiple sclerosis. I mean, there's a, a very long list which affects many, many millions of people. So the thing about these diseases is that although they are, of course, massively important, because they have a different contribution from the environment and from multiple different genes, we don't understand them. We don't understand the genetics, and so they're often overlooked. But that's going to change, and it's going to change with one particular technology in particular, and that is whole genome sequencing. So the first human whole genome sequence was published in 2001 at a cost of approximately $100 million US dollars. And this uh, chart here, you can't see the details, but it doesn't really matter, shows how the cost of sequencing a whole genome of, from humans has decreased in the years since two, 2001. Now, if this cost had decreased according to Moore's law, so, so Gordon Moore was, was one of the co-founders of Intel, and he came up in a 1965 paper with the idea that the number of, he predicted that the number of transistors that you could fit on, a, on an integrated circuit would double more or less every year. The computer power would double every, every year. And there have been different iterations of that idea, but basically he's been right. But if we'd followed with genome sequencing this trajectory, the cost today would be about just under a million US dollars per, genome, per human genome sequence. In fact, something different has happened. If you look at this, just graph, this graph here, which plots uh, logarithmically the last 10 years, the cost has been coming down five times per year, fivefold per year. Every year it gets a fifth of the cost. So that means if we project forward, in five years' time, it will cost just 25 cents to sequence your genome. So what you'll be able to do is you'll be able to go to your local supermarket, to the whole genome sequencing counter, give a swab from your cheek cell. They'll take it off in a drone, and it will be sent to a sequencing center. And then they will produce the information. It will go up to the cloud, and the cloud, and they'll send it to your healthcare provider, or your doctor, or your insurer, or whoever. Fantastic. But what does this mean? Well, I think what it's going to mean is that we're going to identify new disease genes because these sequences at 25 cents each will be able to sequence people from Addis Ababa or Adelaide or Thessaloniki or wherever, and we'll be able to say, well, if you've got that character, that character, that page there, that paragraph there, that paragraph there, then you've got a 78% chance of having hypertension by the time you're 62. And so then people are going to say, well, you know, that this is, and, and they're going to, we're going to find out these associations possibly for all diseases and indeed health. If you've got these things, then you're more likely to be healthy. So the other corollary of this, of course, is that every embryo is going to have some genes or some sequences that predispose to bad things happening, perhaps many years in the future. So what hope will there be for editing to fix these multiple changes? And we return here to our two methods. 
We could edit in the embryo, but this is unlikely because the white window of opportunity is quite short to do multiple editing and to confirm what's happening, and there's a risk that we might end up with scrambled eggs. So it's more likely that we'll use the second method here, gamete editing, where edit sperm and eggs. And very recently, we've started to develop the technology to do this in mice. So what will happen in the future with Mr. T, for example, is that Mr. T will go along and generate iPS cells from his cheek cells, but instead of turning these into neurons, which we did before, after we've done the editing, we can do editing, check it's OK, more editing, check it's OK, of the iPS cells in the dish, then we can turn them into sperm cells and using standard reproductive technology, inject these into eggs, then Mrs. T becomes pregnant so that now Trubshaw Jr. has multiple genes uh, edited from the paternal germline. Similarly with Mrs. T. Mrs. T might have some so-called problem genes, and we can address those too. We can do similar kinds of edits, except this time we can ask the iPS cells derived from Mrs. T to become eggs. So now we can match them both together, and we can produce Trubshaw that's got edits on both sides, multiple edits. So now the carpenter is really given a fantastic uh, toolkit with which to realize his vision. The problem is that his vision and the vision of other people might not be quite the same as Trubshaw's vision. Trubshaw might not be satisfied with repairing disease-predisposing genes. He might want to have a family of, you know, Lara Crofts and Jason Bournes, right? So then that brings the idea of enhancement, using genome editing for enhancement. And this is where we're altering traits genetically that are not necessarily directly related to disease. Things like, I've, I've listed some of them here, it's quite good fun to just think of the lists. Strength, endurance, IQ, for example. This is a kind of transhumanism light, and it, and it, and it kind of introduces the notion of designer babies. But there's also transhumanism not so light, which is much more fantastic, where we're thinking about adding traits to humans, right? You want your kid to be able to fly to school in the morning, madam? No problem. We'll give him or her wings. <laughs> but there's a problem with this. Okay, there are several problems with it. But the one problem that I want to focus on is that we're forgetting the process. So the carpenter is in his or her workshop with the tools which we've given him. He or she has the vision but we're forgetting the process by which he or she applies those tools to realize the vision. And this is the same problem that beset Charles Babbage. Charles Babbage was born in 1791, and he's credited with being one of the pioneers of the modern computer. But he was asked, his computer, his calculator, was called a difference engine. And he was asked more than one time in his lifetime, Mr. Babbage, if I put the wrong values into your calculating machine, will it still give me the right answer? Now, we can laugh at this question, but it's the same mistake that many people are making today, I think. Because we may not know the correct sequences or the correct values. We may not know the correct sequences to edit. We probably do for some single gene conditions, but for the multiple, the complex gene conditions or the complex traits, we almost certainly do not know them. But until we do know them, until we know the correct sequences to edit, we cannot reliably get the right answer. And so if, at the end of this talk, I return to the questions that we asked at the very beginning, what is human heritable genome editing and when will it happen, I think that what we can say is that it will probably be involve CRISPR-Cas9, so that heritable human genome editing is the use of the CRISPR-Cas9 system to make prescribed changes in gametes, in sperm or egg, or early embryos, and that then the when there is some tension here. To accelerate the development, there, is, there will be uh, rapid advances in sequencing technology, and they will drive demand for, sequence, for, the, for editing. But on the other hand, technical, legislative, political, and social considerations may push human genome editing years, perhaps even decades, into the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>